Listen to the AZ Wildcat podcast brought to you by DraftKings. Great deal going on right now. You throw down five dollars on a tournament game, and if that win, uh, if that hits, you get two hundred dollars in free plays. All right, now joined by the man of the hour, Mr. Matt Mulebach. Hello, Matt. How you doing, my man? What's up, Mike? All Mike, right, you Vegas. So you in Vegas. I was in Vegas. Let's talk a little bit about what we saw in Vegas before getting ahead to the NCAA tournament and. You know, to give people privies to a little bit of my text with you, um, <laughs> we were talking matchups the entire time. And let's talk Colorado first before we get to UCLA. This was obviously a revenge game. And Arizona goes in there. Colorado's got better player than I think a lot of people think. And Arizona was able to withstand a 16 for 32 shooting performance by the Buffaloes and come out victorious right there, which really showed me their margin of error. Yeah, and, and and the sixteen for thirty-two inter was to me the interesting story because it was somewhat planned, right? Arizona, you know, from a strategy standpoint, was was giving up that shot, um, and I think they're sort of playing the long game in the game, knowing that Colorado likes to likes to pound it inside, likes to use their their bigs inside, Batty and Jabari Walker, who you talked about. He is, man, in my my opinion, Mike, he he's he may be the one of the best players, maybe the second best player in the Pac-12 behind Ben Mather, and he's big time. He's got a bright future. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it, it just shows you, like you said, a team hits 16 threes and Arizona wins pretty easily at the end. It's crazy. Right. Jabari Walker was a guy that destroyed Arizona the first game, destroyed him in the second game, really, but Arizona was able to withstand that. Where Arizona, to me, was really able to stop things was down low with the bigs, in the first game, Colorado was able to get to the basket wherever they wanted. That didn't happen this second time. Yeah, that was the strategy. Um, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe force him to to shoot a ton of threes, but not be able to hit the rim or get to the rim. They have really good young guards. Um, you know, they're they're not they're not real experienced, and the bigs also, as we just talked about, are good. So keep them out of the lane. It's kind of the defense that everyone's trying to employ against Arizona now. Um, it's switch everything, teams. So it's it's funny because early on in the early on in the season, teams didn't know what to do with Arizona, right. and they pounded them pretty much every which way. And then teams started doing different things. UCLA on all the pick and rolls started plugging, which means that the the the, the guy guarding the ball would really fight hard to get through the screen, or or around on top of the screen. They just plug with a big guy to kind of you know, save a little time. And they did a good job with that. Arizona countered that, I think, in the second matchup. Um, then teams started – one of the teams, I think it was Stanford, was a, one of the first teams to switch one through five. And the reason they would switch one through five is that even though a five-man would be on someone really good from Arizona, they didn't care because it would stop the lob and it would stop the ball handler from getting around the screen and, you know, going downhill and making a play. So – Teams were giving up, just saying, hey, look, we'll pick our poison. We'll give up a right. three or, it, or we'll give up a, a long two. And um, Arizona didn't struggle with it, but I think it was something new for them that they had to deal with. So, you know, they put some stuff in, dealt with that. Um, it's I, I said it on the air, Mike. It kind of reminds me of like the Chiefs, you know, when they've been rolling. Kansas City reference already. I know, right? Got to throw that in. But, you know, teams are just trying to figure out how, how do you stop them? And so all these sort of strategies were born out of that. And then, you know, it's, someone might stop them for two or three games and then, okay, they figure that out and so forth. So you know, I get it. Teams are trying whatever they can against Arizona. But as you said, they got a big margin. All right, let's talk UCLA, Arizona. This to me was very nostalgic because you and I talked about it a little bit. When you were playing the mid nineties, that to me was the zenith of Arizona, UCLA, where you had Jim Herrick doing his thing at UCLA. Arizona, you might slap me right there, and I don't blame you, but UCLA was the only teams that I've ever watched when Arizona was at its peak in the conference that I'm like, 
they might have a few more players, a little bit more talent than us. And there was always a feeling when that Saturday game hit, hit, and whether it was Dick Vitale calling it, Billy Packer calling it, whoever was calling it, it was a big deal. This to me first feels like the first time since then that both programs are an incredibly solid footing going forward. And I think you're going to see a lot more classic matchups like you saw this past week. Completely agree. Uh, what Mick Cronin has been there three years and it looks like he could be there for a long time. Um, Arizona fans, you know, Tommy Lloyd, I think they hope he's going to be there for ever. <laughs> Not a long time, forever. <laughs> um, no, I'm with you. And, and, Don McLean and I were talking about on, on our pregame show, you know, in the early 90s, the best players in the West Coast went to two schools. They went to Arizona or they went to UCLA. And a lot of the best players, a lot of those players were like best friends. You know, they grew up playing AAU ball. They're both from, you know, guys from L.A., guys from Southern California, a few from Northern California like myself. It was it was just it was California dominated. Um, the talent level, there was a game that I played in. I think I was the only player in the starting five that didn't play in the NBA. The next year, McLean said there were 16 players from both teams that played in the NBA. I mean, think about that. 16. That's, I called him on it. I said, I don't even, I don't even believe that. He goes, no, I looked it up and I, I still don't believe it. <laughs> like, right. has, has that ever happened? But it just, it just shows you that, like you said, that, that, rivalry has always been to me you know the biggest and the baddest and the best you know west of the west of kansas and west of like mississippi of the of, of the of the midwest i think it's the in the top three or four best rivalries in college basketball see i think back to 1995 96 even and that wasn't a vintage arizona team a very good arizona team but you look at just the roster right there reggie geary modern day miles simon don't have errors or ucla offers excuse me Loot turned them into guys that certainly UCLA probably wishes they had offered. Michael Dickerson, Jason Terry, Youngster. These are guys that are probably the equivalent to what, top 75, top 50 recruits, not the McDonald's guys. Then right. you look at UCLA, you got Toby Bailey, every all everything, Jelani McCoy, uh, J.R. Henderson, Chris Johnson, across the board. Now you look at the roster here, you look at UCLA and what they have right there, and it, it's again, it's just kind of nostalgic, Matt, and we'll, yeah. we'll move on here. But it was just awesome being able to watch that yeah. and watch that type of game that you were able to obviously call after the game. And one thing I got to tell people, and I'm a little all over the place, this UCLA team is darn good that Arizona just beat. And if they make an Elite Eight or a Final Four run, it shouldn't surprise anyone. Well, I was looking at the bracket. I think they're are they in Kansas, can't the Kansas bracket, I think they are. Mm -hmm. Um, if I'm Kansas, I'm like, how the heck is UCLA in that bracket? Right. They're, they're 10 in the net and they would potentially have to play them in the, is it sweet 16? I think, right. No, is that the, I think they're the Baylor bracket. No, well, the Baylor, the Baylor bracket. Right. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I, that was, that's correct. I mean, I'm looking at that. I mean, if I'm Baylor, I'm like, how we got, we got potentially UCLA in the sweet 16 and UCLA could have been a two or a three UCLA's up what 12 or 13 on Arizona Saturday. If they win that game, I believe they would have been a two seed. So I think they were misplaced as a four. They should have been a three. And like I said, just, you know, Baylor's going to have to potentially play a, a two seed in their in their third game, which that is that's tough. OK, let's look ahead to the NCAA tournament first. DraftKings Sportsbook app, code word PHNX. Here's the deal. You throw down five dollars on an NCAA tournament game. And if that team wins, you get two hundred dollars in free plays. That simple, that easy. You could take, you could back the A. You could do whatever you want. Arizona only twenty one and up. If you got a gambling problem, call one eight hundred Next Step. They'll get you all taken care of. Okay, Andre Veras put right here. What team in that region does Matt not want to see? Whether it's because of bad matchup or something else, I've got a team. I'm going to let Matty M go first though. Um, I mean, to me, to me, um, I mean, it's Villanova, but they're a two seed. So that's not right. like, that's any big upset. Right. I, I would say Houston, um, Houston's right. three in the net three, right? Like on paper, they could be a one seed 
Right. <laughs> and you might face them potentially in what? The second round? Is that right? No, the third. That'd be Sweet 16. Right. Um, and I just got to say this. Two other things that, of note. Um, they were in the Final Four last year. It's not and like everyone's this, back. And everyone's back. This is not a surprise team. Are you kidding me? Now, I guess I, I didn't look at their resume top to bottom, but I guess they have – you know, they don't have a whole lot of quad one wins, but I don't, maybe they didn't have a whole lot of opportunities. I don't know why they didn't, but there's a final four team that just went there a year ago. And now they're a five seed. That to me was a complete misseeding. Um, the other thing I'll say about it is, and you know, this from back in the day, I think you were around and watching and pretty up to date on your, when Kelvin Sampson was around, Kelvin Sampson was a really good coach, really good coach. I respect him a ton. Um, so yeah, that was the team that jumped out to me. Yes. I look at it and people talk about Tennessee and that potential rematch that Arizona had earlier in the season. Here's what I told people. And I told your guy, Mike Yam, by the way, who was given a Matt Muehlbach yeah, shout out right there. The humor. Right. So he asked me about the Tennessee game. And what I told him was, I don't really worry too much about Tennessee. Granted, they can beat Arizona. You just beat Kentucky. You beat whoever you sure. can beat anybody. But Arizona played one of its worst games of the seasons. It was a little bit of questionable officiating. Again, that happens at home, in the home courts. And, oh, by the way, Arizona had a chance to win with two minutes left. And this is in a game, too, where Arizona had 10 turnovers in the first 10 minutes. And it wasn't like these were, you know, where you're just being swarmed. You were just being crazy, lazy with the ball. I think Arizona matches up well with Tennessee. I agree with that. Um for all those reasons, I also agree, or I also would state that I think I think when a team plays a team once in the season, especially like a non-conference game, and you have to play them in the tournament, there's a little bit of edge when you've lost the first game. Mm -hmm. and, and and I would switch not everything you said, but I'd switch what I just said with Illinois, right? Mm -hmm. Arizona beat Illinois on the road, so you'd say, oh, okay, if they have to play Illinois, they should be okay. But there, there's a little edge. You know, not to not to like put a knife in my my back, my own back. But, you know, in 1989, when we lost to UNLV, we beat them in Tucson. And I wouldn't say we beat them easily, but we beat them comfortably. You always had um, them and I've watched that game about five or six times already. But you always had them a little bit at arm's length. You didn't blow them out, but it always felt like it was about four to ten. That was exactly what happened in Tucson. And it, and it, and it can give you a false sense of security. Um and um, so, yeah, I've always, I've always sort of liked that team that has the, that has that, that, that chip on their shoulder on the second game. So, I'm with you on Tennessee. Like you said, they, they could beat Arizona. Arizona doesn't play well, or if Tennessee plays well, it, it could happen. I made this point to someone the other day. I said, look, here's why this tournament, and this is maybe obvious, but to think about it, is that if Arizona plays almost anyone in their bracket in the best four out of seven. They would they would almost win every time. Now I don't know about Villanova, not not sure about some of the others there, but you'd make a good argument they would win every one of those four out of seven games, if, if a series of four out of seven. But the 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 one game scenario that's what makes the tournament special. It's what makes it terrible sometimes for high seeds because it's a lot of pressure. Um, but I feel like I feel like Tommy's got such a great. I feel like he's got a great attitude about that, like how he – and he's, you know, he's done it at Gonzaga, even though he was the assistant and wasn't the head coach. I love his I love his mantra of attacking and mm -hmm. saying, look, we haven't done anything. Let's just attack. And that's a totally – it kind of changes the paradigm of being, hey, we're the big guy. We're the number one seed. You know, let's see if somebody can go beat us. He says, no, turn, turn that. We'll go after them. Every coach talks about how we're going to run. We're going to run. Nobody says we're going to play slow. Tony Bennett tells people he's going to run when, but when Tommy Lloyd said, we're going to run, not because it's a great recruiting pitch, because it's the best way to win. That was the first time where I'm like, that's a coach that 100% means it right there. And not that other coaches don't, but Matt, he 100% meant it just by that elaboration right there. Yeah. Yeah. Just, he, he meant it like Lute Olson used to mean mm -hmm. it. Right. Right. I mean, Lute used to do it. It's, it's the idea of just letting guys go, right? Co right? Coaching them, coaching them during the week, and then when Thursday and Friday come or Saturday comes, let them play. Right. And, um, and I got to give you a lot of credit, by the way. 
So you and I were talking about the Arizona UCLA matchups, and I scoffed a little bit when you said, well, they're going to put Coloco on Jaime Jaquez. And because I'm thinking to myself, different Jaime Jaquez. Lo and behold, when it was winning time, Matt Muehlbach came through. <laughs> Christian Coloco is the one on Jaime Jaquez. As an ex-player, can you tell people how rare it is to have a seven-foot-one big man who is guarding in space yeah. a six-foot-seven scorer who will play in the NBA? Yeah. I, I can never remember it in college. Like it happens in the NBA all the time, right? Because of matchups and guys are, you know, KD. But that's guys like Kevin Garnett and yeah. stuff. They play the three sometimes, right. you know. I've never seen it in college. I've never heard of heard of it in college. Um, I'm sure there's examples and, you know, the kid from Kentucky, maybe he could do it, right? Um, mm -hmm. But um, no, it's, it's insane. And, um, you know, we saw it against Oregon. I look back, I saw a highlight of that the other day. It like dawned on me, like when Will Richardson tried to take that last shot, he couldn't even get a three. Mm -hmm. And it was almost like Coloco baited him into getting inside the line, even though I think they were down three at the time. Correct. So even if he had got the shot off, what would it have mattered? It wouldn't have mattered. So and that was a Hail Mary three. It was a Hail Mary, and he got it blocked, I think, right? For it sure. Block. <laughs> right. It, right. It's stunning how good he is on that side of the on that side of the court. All right, let's talk a little Kirk Carissa. And I make this point all the time, and I made the point earlier today, that there's not a better backup point guard option in the country than Justin Kyer. Kirk Carissa, um, obviously, is he's taken a lot of arrows this year, but say what you want. This is a guy that can be 3 of 15, but those last two shots are going to be in the last two minutes that go in right there. Justin Kyer comes in, and he's just steady. It looks like he's a 24-year-old, sixth-year college player, which he is. Arizona beat UCLA without Kirk Carissa and Justin Kyer in foul trouble. What does that tell you? You mentioned at the beginning of this of this podcast, margin. Right. The margin's crazy. And I'll give you a little bit of credit. Number one, it tells you that Dalen Terry's a player. Yeah. And I know you're really high on Dalen. You've been the one that's pushed me on him a lot. Not that I mean, I love Dalen Terry, but yeah, you, you've been on him. You may have been as high or on him as anyone in the country. Mm -hmm. And I almost had a triple double right. <laughs> in the game. I mean, so, and by the way, I think if they, if DT wasn't going at the point, they probably could have put Pella Larson there. So they, they have like four. Here's the thing Tommy Lloyd, and he talked about this, what he has done with the team and the way he's developed them is they're not like Oregon, and I know you love Dane Altman, where Oregon doesn't have, you know, Dana likes to talk about never having a point guard or a two right. guard. It's just guards. He has wings and guards and forwards. It's it's not to that extent, but it's it's where Tommy Lloyd just wants to put guys in positions to be, to be playmakers. And so he's really developed them and talked to them about being playmakers, right? And so that's what they do. Um, and so they've 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 been they've been schooled at it so much they've been, become really good playmakers. Um, the other thing I want to give you credit for, we were going back and forth with about Jaime Hawkes because I, I was trying to find a comp for him, and it was difficult because he's so unique and he's so good. And you gave me a really good one, Luke Walton, which we actually used on our show. And again, they're a little different. They're actually not they're not hundred percent, but the way. I like the comp because it was they both get to there the same way, which is they can face up, they can back to the basket, they can use six, seven dribbles, which you don't see in college. How how often very do you rare. see that in college? It's very rare. In fact, it's rare that teams even go ISO that much in college, and UCLA does that. So you have to have the combination of the ISO and then a player to do it. So thank you for the for the tip on that. I just try to give you as much wiggle room as possible right there. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yes. All right. Real quick, guys. DraftKings Sportsbook app, code word PHNX. Throw down $5 on any of the tournament games. And if your team wins, you get $200 in free plays. New customers only. Eligibility restrictions apply. This is the time you want to hop on. NCAA tournament. All kinds of stuff going on right here. And, you know, I don't know if there's any teams from Kansas City in here. KCMO probably isn't in there, so not sure that you could throw that one in there. But back Arizona, if you want, that'll be a good way to get some money for you. All right, Matt.
Let's talk about Umar Ballo a little bit. I was wrong on this guy when he came in. I thought we were going to look at a little bit of guy who is probably going to be five, six, seven minutes. Roster roster filler is not as such a condescending term. I don't mean it like that. But a guy that was just out there. He is a difference maker, and he is an intimidator. If UCLA had him, I mean, you're looking at something entirely different, as good as UCLA is. Yeah, it, it reminds me of – well, it does a few things. Number one, it reminds me of like a running back where you have a two-headed monster, right? And you have like USC uh, back in the day, like USC. Yeah, it was Lindale White. That's mm-hmm. a that's that's the comp, right? Right. So you've got Reggie Bush in in Coloco that's fast, crazy athletic, and then you and then he comes out, and then you bring in Lindale White to just smash people, <laughs> and it's hard to deal with, you know. And the other thing it does is a team like UCLA or whoever the team is, they have to put their five man on that player. Cause if they don't, they will just destroy him and they might destroy him anyway. But then what it does is now in college, you look over to the four man and now they got to guard a 6'11, 255 Lithuanian named Majulis Tabellis. Right. And it's like, your four man's not built to guard that guy. Your five man might be built to guard Tabellis possibly, but the four men are not. And so as we talked about Hawk as good as he is, how does Hawkes now match up with Tubelis? And then I'll take it one step further, put both Coloco and Balo in there together. And it's 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 incredible. And you know this better than anybody. Matt, legitimately, how tall are you? Six two. Okay, six two. When you have to go against guys who you might be better than, but they're three or they're four inches taller than you, they weigh 25, 30 pounds. Po- you can get away with that for 30 minutes because you're the better player, but after a while it starts to wear you down a little bit. And you just see that when Arizona plays against these teams. It, it, totally. Yeah. The, the wear down factor is big. And again, that's the, that's back to the football analogy, the running back analogy in the fourth quarter, you got nothing left on those defenses. Um, I had to guard a guy my freshman year named Craig McMillan. Now, it wasn't like I was better than Craig. He first McDonald's kid in Lute's Lute era, right? First McDonald's All-American ever at Arizona. And he was a legit 6'6", six, six, maybe 6'7", six, but he was a two-guard. Mm-hmm. And he just – he wore me down. You know, like like you said, I might play with him for a few plays, but after a while it was it was really tough to guard him. And, um, no, that's, that's a huge factor. All right. Before we hop off here – Ben Matherin's probably going to be playing his last few games here at U of A. I mean, who knows what can happen? He can certainly come back. When you look at Ben, and let's let's just say that this is his last his swan song right here. What are you going to remember most about ben, watching Ben? Um, you know, I think honestly the development of him and and how much you know he's developed since that first year because he you know he's done he's gotten so much better over the last whatever months it is. And, um, you know, when he first came here, a tremendous athlete, he was a really good shooter in certain spots, but he had a couple catch and shoots, or actually I shouldn't say catch and shoots. They were off picks where he was flying out to the wing, caught it. And, you know, not the old traditional catch and shoot where you roll into a jumper. He's, he's catching off of, off of screens, turning around, you know, with his 40 some inch vertical and shooting threes and did it two times in a row the second half. I think one of the biggest things I've ever seen from him was Saturday. And there's been a question about an Arizona go-to guy. What do you do in the last minute? Who do you go to? Cause he hasn't necessarily been that go-to right. guy. He, he just, he's just an, you know, a phenomenal player. And he can hit you in spurts, but it's not necessarily right. clear out, you know, one, four type stuff. That's right. And so what I was impressed with was the fact that he had 15 free throws. And the most free throws he ever shot before Saturday was 11. And the 15, he was 13 of 15, and probably won the game. And the reason that was big to me was he decided he was going to be the go-to guy. And when you get 15 free throws, it's not by accident. It's not because, oh, I just was in the you know harm's way and somebody fouled me. It means you're taking over and you're just you're imposing your will on the other team. And and that was to me, just the development of of this, you know, raw athletic kid that came in and sort of, you know, understanding of the game and becoming just a smarter, better, all-around player. 
What's impressed me too is that he's got more of an NBA game than I thought going into the season. He has had a couple of the James Harden step to the side threes where you're yeah. just kind of like, well, I didn't know he had that in his pocket right, right there. Right. And you you follow the NBA game fairly closely. You've got some buddies on the Warriors that I, you know, I think think people know about. What kind of pro you think he's going to be? I think he'll be fantastic. We were talking about it with Casey Jacobson on the show, and he's comparing him to Anthony Edwards. Is it Anthony Edwards from yeah. um, the number Georgia. one from mm-hmm. Georgia? I mean, <laughs> that's it's a heck of a comparison, that's, right that's there. An amazing comparison. I was like, the more I thought about it, I was I was pretty I was mm-hmm. I was kind of on board. You know, like Edwards might be a little bigger. Um, he's a little quicker in and out for sure. Yeah, but, and, you know, and you have to break it all down. But it's it's he's in the look, he's in the conversation of that comparison. That's the number one pick. And he's a guy that's thriving in the right. NBA. When the court opens up and Ben gets a chance, he's gonna make jump shot. I mean, he can shoot it. You have to be able to shoot it in the NBA and he can shoot it at a high level. I mean, he's I, he's gotta be he's gotta he could be a potential all-star. A lot of it just depends to me on on like, you know, what does he want? And does he does he become an incredibly you know, devoted player um, in that area. And I think of someone like Kobe Bryant, you know, the, the black Mamba. And, you know, I was thinking about Ben the other day and I was thinking about when I watch him, he reminds me actually of a snake because he's coiled. He's so like, he's like ready to just, just unleash at any moment, that kind of like gear that he has. And I was thinking about, I wanted to call him the Viper, you know, from the, from right. the, from the Kill Bill series. Right. I, I do exactly where you're going there. You could have a good nickname, the Viper. But anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed with the guy a lot. All right. Before we let you go, Matt, I'm going to sign off too. How far you got Arizona going? Oh, I got him playing. I got him playing KU. My, my, my in-laws are from KU. Mm-hmm. Hopefully I can be down there in New Orleans. Right. I got him head to head with Gonzaga in the final. Me too. Can you imagine the storylines going into that game right there? It, it would be it'd be sick. Right? I also think those are the two most complete teams in the I country. Bias aside, and I think they match up the best with each other. They can both go they height for height right there because you got Holmgren, you got Timmy, you're seven one, six nine, obviously Coloco Tabellas. And then on the wings, you've obviously got Ben, Daylin. You know, and then obviously you're going back with Nemhard, Rasir, Bolton. Yeah, I think they match up incredibly well. Yeah, they always say styles make fights. Like mm-hmm. that, this is the opposite. These are the exact same teams. Right. I mean, it's like it's like two mirror images playing each other, and it would be it would be off the charts. You've got two Mike Tyson's at age 22 walking into <laughs> each other <laughs> right there. <that's> right. <laughs> but Matt, as always, can't appreciate can't th- thank you enough. Pre- sorry about some of the uh, technical issues. But again, as always, you are the man. Mike, appreciate it, man. Appreciate your coverage. And I'll be right. checking you out when you're out there in uh, San Diego. Yep. You got it, my man. You'll be hearing from me. <laughs> for, Take, for Matt Mealbox, I'm Mike Luke. You've been listening to the AZ Wildcats podcast.